Welcome to Simply Walk the Talk. Our bodies and minds adapt to what we do most of the time. If you want to change your body and mind, you must change what it is you do most of the time. This podcast explores all things health, wellness, fitness, lifestyle, and biohacking. Stay tuned as we explore various thoughts, methods, and experiences from a multitude of conversations between our interesting guests and experts through many fields of work. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Simply walk the Simply walk the All right, so um, let's grab our relaxators and uh, let's do this this one minute breath session, yeah? Yeah, let's do that. I think that was about one minute. <laughs> okay. All right, man. I feel, uh, I feel reset, refreshed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, everyone welcome to the show. If you are only listening, that may have been a bit awkward for you because that was, uh, Mr. Anders Olsen and I doing a quick little breath session with the relaxator device. And we will talk about, all things, the relaxator, breathing, CO2, carbon dioxide, uh, a lot of things we're going to discuss. And this is actually kind of a first with Mr. Anders and I, because um, we're, we're going to essentially run this as a interview back and forth, right? So yeah. uh, Anders wants to, to sort of interview me, and, and I obviously want to interview him. And it's so funny, because when we were setting up this, uh, this appointment, <laughs> he had thought that he was going to be interviewing me. And so I was going to come onto his platform and then vice versa. And yet here we are. So we're recording. Um, so if you're, if you're a fan and a, a, a loyal listener of, of Simply Walk the Talk, welcome back to the show. I'm Joshua J. Holland, your host. Today I have Anders Olsen on the show. <laughs> so hi, Mr. Olsen. How's it going? All is going very well. Hi, Josh. Nice to meet yeah. you. And, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion. I think we share something in common here, breathing, carbon dioxide and health. And uh, we had this talk a few weeks ago, probably we should have recorded it then, but then we realized that we, we definitely should record something. That's right. Yeah, yeah I remember it was, it was a very, very fascinating conversation because, you know, I, I'll just kind of jump into it. You know, I... I heard about you and I sort of looked into what you do by way of um, the book Breath. And, and actually before the book Breath with James Nestor, um, I actually heard about you because I, I had purchased the, uh, the sleep tape and the relaxator. Right. And I, I didn't quite put two and two together, but as I was reading through the book, um, I kept noticing this name, you know, the name of the person that was together with with James Nestor doing all of this research. Yeah. And um, and then, of course, when you go to ConsciousBreathing.com, which is your, you know, your company, the website, yeah. um, 
I see you on there and there's a lot of things happening, but then fast forward to the conversation we had a few weeks ago and I'm like, wow, this is great because I'm actually speaking to an expert, like not someone who's just, uh, you know, they, they have some certification they went through over a weekend or they, they, they learn from this person or that thing. You've been doing this for a long time, right? Yeah, so 2009, that was when I really discovered the power of our breath. When I uh, read a book, uh, how to swap asthma for life and it was mainly about breathing that was the key thing in order to uh, reduce your asthma problems and i noticed on myself how i was able to calm down and that has been uh, yeah more or less the history of my life having a lot of stress in my head and just by realizing that that stress is mimicked in your breath and by just changing the way you breathe to instead of breathing fast and shallow and maybe through the mouth and then instead doing the opposite, just slow down your breathing, breathing low and rhythmically and through the nose, that made a huge difference. So for me, it, it was a starting point in 2009. It's, and I'm not exaggerating when I said it has changed my life. Right. Well, yeah. if, if, if you're okay with it, I, I'd love to go ahead and, and, and read what I prepared for your intro uh, okay simply yeah, because sure. uh, yeah because I, I find it fascinating because I when when doing research when it comes to uh, interviewing people I like to mm. research obviously and I like to kind of figure things out and I learned a few things and and so I jotted a few notes down just to be able to yeah. kind of help introduce you and I think it will be very helpful for my viewers and listeners so um, here's what I have over a decade ago, Anders headed out on an incredible journey. That's when he decided to become the world's foremost expert in breathing. So how does one get the idea of becoming an expert on breathing? Well, after living a life with a racing mind, he has been fortunate enough to come across different tools that have helped him to relax and find his inner calm. The most powerful of those tools have, without a doubt, been to improve his breathing. Anders founded his own company in 1990, importing computers from Taiwan. 15 years later, he sold his company and fulfilled his quote unquote dreams. But during his quest for money, gadgets and success, the last years brought about this increasingly nagging feeling that something was missing. On the surface, he appeared successful, but on the inside, he felt overworked, drained and surprisingly empty. A feeling that there has to be something more constantly ate at him. He began researching and experimenting with different breathing techniques and soon developed a concept that literally transformed his body, mind, and overall health. The Conscious Breathing Retraining Program evolved out of his personal experience, courses, books, and research on relaxation techniques, yoga, qigong, the Buteco method, mental training and body awareness, as well as feedback from several thousand students, athletes, skilled doctors, therapists, and many other wise people. That's Mr. Anderson. <laughs> Anders Olsen, everyone. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. I, I, again, I learned a few things in just kind of writing that out and, and, and reiterating it. Um, so it's, it's not just, oh, I had some breathing problems and I learned how to fix it. I mean, you really have, you've done this thing. I mean, you're, you're truly an expert at it. I mean, that's how I mind works, how I operate, right? If I really like something, I want to dwell deep into it and really learn the ins and outs. So that's how I approach breathing. When I first realized uh, the effect it had on myself, I wanted to see if others could have the effect as well. And um, putting together the, the, the information I came across in a systematic way was how I approached it. And basically my idea is that I don't like so much about talking about right or wrong, or oh, this is wrong breathing, or this is right breathing. We, we, we have a tendency to live too much in our brain and where good and bad and uh, uh, nice or ugly or whatever it is, uh, we, we tend to divide things. So I see it more as we have a tendency to go more towards activity breathing, which would be mouth breathing, fast breathing, shallow breathing, holding our breath, while recovery breathing will be basically the opposite nasal breathing low breathing using our diaphragm slow breathing and and rhythmic breathing and that 
many people seem to end up in activity breathing more, which is similar to fight, flight, parasym uh, sorry, sympathetic, uh, adrenaline, mm -hmm. etc. And and I think in general, if you if we were to define uh, poor health and disease and compared to health, one way of defining that could be that we spend too much time in fight flight, we react too much from incoming st stimuli by a fight flight response. And you can see that in the breath, the breath will, will mimic that. So, so what we may mm -hmm. want to do is learn to uh, realize, okay, right now I'm in activity breathing. My breathing is a reflection of what's going on inside my thoughts, my emotions and my physical body, which is then in more fight flight state. And then an understanding that that is where I am and an understanding of how do I get to um, recovery breathing. So, so the, the breath is both a, a tool, it, sorry, it, it's both a reflection of what's going on inside of us. And it's also a tool to take us from activity to recovery. And since we take about 1000 breaths an hour, it has over time quite a profound effect, whether we are too much in the fight flight activity, or if we're able to once in a while, uh, go to recovery and, and feel safe and, and secure. Well said, I, I don't yeah. think it could be put any better. And I, I think a number of things come to mind when speaking about breathing, because let's face it, most people or a lot of people say, okay, but it's breathing. Like it's something that we, we do, you know, sort of autonomically, we don't really have to think about it, but it's one of those, one of those things that we, that we do do automatically or autonomically, but we also have the power to, to, to change it. Unlike some of the other systems that run autonomically. Right. So, um, yeah. let's, let's talk about like, let's just dive into it because I, I feel like some people just like with running, for instance, people think, Oh yeah, but we were born to run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, sorry if I interrupt, but I'd like uh, my listeners to get an introduction to you. From what I've read, you sure. are a celebrity trainer, right? I see you work with uh, Madonna, <laughs> with, with uh, Roger Waters from Pink Floyd, with um, what's his name, the actor uh, Oscar Isaac. Um, yeah. what, what, how did that come about? Did you wake up one morning, I'm going to be a celebrity trainer, or, or can you please share more, a little more about your background? Sure. Um, yeah, like the, as you might imagine, I, I'm type of, I'm the type of person that doesn't like to get caught up on, on labels and titles, mm -hmm. but I know how important it is for, yeah. for, you know, the, the prevalence of, let's say articles or, or interviews, or even to just have people understand that, okay, if these people, if these, this level of person is working with Josh, then, then maybe we should listen because, okay, they could probably work with anyone in the world. So I do get that. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, the people I work with are people. I mean, they're, ju they're just, they're very much people. And I did not start out. I mean, I never would have guessed if you had like somehow interviewed me when I was 12 years old, I would have never guessed that I was going to be a quote unquote celebrity trainer. But I was always, uh, since I can remember, I've always been very interested in, in the the way that the human body works and the human mind um and i started off when i was four years old i was uh sort of born into martial arts mm -hmm. and when you when a person dives deep enough into the the arts the martial arts you start to understand that there's a lot that has to do with energy and mm -hmm. uh you know like things like chi and and meditation and you know the the way that things flow and balance and um and that kind of started me out very much learning about what happens inside of our bodies and then how we express that outwardly mm -hmm. but then also even with breath right i didn't realize it until kind of now that we're talking about it but like mm -hmm. i even learned how to be able to control my breath to be able to keep a certain amount of tension within my core to be mm -hmm. able to take a punch or a kick to the stomach or yeah. whatever. Um, also to be able to mitigate the, the stress response when I'm lying on a bed of nails or I'm about to break a brick 
with my hand or or mm-hmm. whatever, right? Um, but in my dad's karate system, in our family system, in order to become a black belt, you one has to learn, you have to certify in anatomy. So you need to know all the muscles, bones, organs mm-hmm. of the body. Okay. You also, because my dad was an EMT uh, and, a, and the chief of police, he also instilled the fact that he wanted all of his black belts to be able to do, uh, to certify in first aid and CPR. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then you also have to have a certain amount of teaching hours. So at 12 years old, me being a 12 year old, then I got my black belt, which means I certified oh. in first aid, CPR, uh, anatomy, all the bones, muscles, and, and uh, organs of the body. And I had to be able to teach people who were three, four times my age and have them respect me because of my experience. And so if you understand that, that's kind of the mind of young Josh. And then it just kind of expanded and branched out from there. And lo and behold, I kind of, I, the, the reason why I, I'm able to work with celebrity clients and things like that is because very simply put, I was at the right place at the right time with the willingness to to take a chance, take a risk mm-hmm. with a certain amount of, of, of a proper skill set to be able to kind of walk through that door and show what I can do. Yeah. So that's me in a nutshell. Cool. <laughs> and as some say, luck is something you deserve. So. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. A, co- a coach. Putting it. Yeah. Like you did. A, a basketball coach of mine used to say. It was, it's a common, a common phrase, but it's, uh, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and I so think you, you, well you're said. interesting, Brett, you always had that with you. My experience is that martial arts is, is one of the few sports where, where it is quite common that there is knowledge about, uh, the breath. Yeah. It is about to change now, but, it, but in general, it has been so up until now, at least. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, um, I recall like doing, uh, what we call katas or forms, Mm -hmm. which is simply like, uh, choreographed movements that is designed to simulate a fight. And when you do that, you, 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 you let out a kia, which is, is, is this breath. It's like, um, a forceful breath out. Right. And um, you squeeze here and, and you, you tense up. So you get the force from your stomach. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. And so speaking of that, like when you say, you know, um, tensing up and learning how to control different parts, you can control mm-hmm. the, the, the nasal cavity, the mouth, the pursing of the lips, the closing of the throat, the, the squeezing of the, the muscles around the core. This is kind of what I was talking about in, in a roundabout way when I did my video on the relaxator, you know, yeah. because our, our, our bodies have something similar to this right you just created a really cool tool if, if you're if you're watching the video you see i'm holding up the relaxator and anders and i we both started this this uh, video with a, a quick session but um you know we have the tools within our bodies to do what this potentially can do the, yeah. the thing is is we have to we have to learn how to do that though or yeah, we have to relearn the, how to do that yeah the relaxator gives you a resistance you can adjust the resistance of your choice so that you exhale through a resistance and for this little device to give effect, you don't have to sit there and, and feel that, oh, I'm having a big resistance. I'm really doing breathing retraining now. It's actually more, in my view, I started off that thought that the, the smaller hole that is open, the more resistance I have, the better my breathing is. But actually, breathing to a large extent is about relaxation. At the end of the day, we, we should not need to pay attention to our breath. So we should try to in this stressful society that we find ourselves in and these breathing habits mimic that stress we should f- be able to to have a relaxed breathing even under stress and what a lot of people say is that the relaxator helps them to uh, to create this low and slow and and rhythmical breathing mm-hmm. yeah 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 i what i like to do is i i like to when a person gets their relaxator, um, yeah. I like to just kind of do a quick trial with them, kind of a, a N of one experiment. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'll have them. And for me, a lot of this stuff, you know, and you can tell me if I should do it a different way or if I should change something no. here. Now I'm open to it because you're the expert, of course. But 
a lot of this is is my how I experience it. It's just it makes sense in my brain. So I tell a person, okay, for instance, maybe do a uh, a soft inhale, okay, mm-hmm. because you don't want to be too aggressive with your inhale, right? But let's mm-hmm. do a yeah. soft inhale, and then you can choose to either momentarily hold that and think about where that air is being able to kind of populate throughout the body Mm -hmm. or just do a soft inhale and then a very soft, slow, long exhale. And then let's try to do that a handful of times. And what I tell people is I'd like for you to try to get to around 10 seconds on the exhale. Not Mm -hmm. that that number means anything. It's just, I, I want them to understand that I don't want the exhale to be fast. Yeah. At the same time, I don't want them to necessarily try to hold their breath for a long period of time. So no. when when they do that without the relaxator, we usually can kind of measure that out a couple seconds. Let's say, you know, let's say they get to eight seconds. Yeah. But they they understand that like, whoa, OK, that was tough. You know, eight se- seconds was tough. So they do that yeah. a few rounds. I simply give them the relaxator, have it put it at like level three and they're immediately immediately surprised at how long their exhale becomes yeah. it, it almost doubles every time i do yeah, that that's my experience too always it's it's almost still after 10 years using this i'm i'm still surprised wow it can really yeah. help you prolong the exhale that long and and uh, the listener may ask okay why do we want to prolong the exhale and a way to explain that is again if we come from the sympathetic and parasympathetic so if i'm exaggerating <gasps> Inhaling is tied to activation, to sympathetic. If you measure the pulse, it will go up. The, the muscles, they work. The diaphragm moves down and the, the chest muscles, they expand to give room for the, the lungs to expand. While the exhale, it is the opposite. We can hear it in, ah, the danger is over. We can relax and we sigh in relief. We prolong the exhalation, implying that we have before been tensed up and holding our breath maybe so by prolonging so we can see when we exhale the pulse will actually go down there is no active muscle movement the muscles they just collapse back to their original resting position and uh, so by prolonging the exhale we can get more into the recovery so we can actually find that we, we we move in in the the from sympathetic to parasympathetic and then back and forth with every breath actually which is also known as heart rate variability right yeah it's connected yeah yeah, yeah. it's connected so okay let, let's let's talk about the so so you mentioned the exhale and prolonging the exhale yeah uh we talked about how it's a bit more in recovery and things like that but let, let's also, if, if you're if you're okay with it, let's talk about this this balance of CO two and O two, yeah. carbon dioxide My and oxygen. Because I think, yeah, of course, and and mine too, especially yeah. because I've learned a lot from working with you on this. And um, and yeah, let's just dive into it, and then of course, you know, we can we can, you know, switch from there afterwards. Yeah, let, let's do that. But just before, can I ask, you have had the relaxator for some time now. What is your experience from you or, or also from others that have used it? Have you noticed that um, specifically? So I'll be honest. Um, the So when I first got it, I, I didn't fully understand what nice. I understand now. Yeah. Okay. And so that's one thing I think people will get when they talk to me, they're going to get honesty and, and, and that's for sure. And that's probably the reason why I hadn't done the things that I've done now with it, you know, yeah. videos, talking to people about it, making sure all of my clients have it, you know, mm-hmm. make sure, making sure my family have it, all of that stuff. Um, and, and the reason is, is because I thought, well, I, I don't do mouth breathing. I do everything nasally. Yeah. That, that was the original thought, honestly. Like I, I had, gotten myself to the point where I already understood, I knew that we should be using the nose as yeah. our breathing tool. Yeah. And so when I got this thing, I was like, well, I was thinking, I honestly thought it was supposed to be one of those things that prevent you from breathing out. And I was like, well, 
I usually run with water in my mouth or I have a something in my in my in, be, in between my teeth. I used to have my clients do that. And so mm-hmm. I go, why do I okay, I'll 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 leave it in my bag in case somebody else needs to use it, but I already mm-hmm. know how to breathe without using my mouth. Yeah. Then I started to finally fully understand when I kind of uh, I think I was preparing to to speak with you and I mm-hmm. and I whipped it out again and I, I started to kind of look through your amazing YouTube videos, which, by the way, uh, we should link to that when we do the description here uh, and possibly even bring some up if you want to share your screen. But uh, you have some really amazing YouTube videos. So if you guys don't don't follow or subscribe Anders and, and the Conscious Breathing guys, definitely go and, and, and look them out because you have very short video clips, easy to follow along, and I mean, I, I, it's very, very helpful. So that's what I learned to be able to help my clients because I wanted to know exactly how I use it and then how they could potentially use it and benefit from it. So I had to do the research. So to answer your question fully, uh, it's a it's an, a tool that I use every single day, mm-hmm. every single day. Awesome. And I find that it it really helps to dive into the uh, meditation part of what I want to do. Yeah. Um, and I don't use it every day, all day, but I use mm-hmm. it definitely in the morning. And I use it before any sort of like uh, intense focus related work. Yeah. And then I also sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes I like to use it at night right before I go to bed. Right. So, um, Yeah. So That's I would say show. your experience is the average experience. Uh, but I, I did the same. Where, uh, I mean, this device, there are a number out there on the market, so I haven't really invented anything. I just didn't like the ones that were out there, so I, I thought I'd do my own. But when I first got a similar to the relaxator in my hand, I was very skeptical. <laughs> no way. Just, just like you, I'm, I'm a nasal breather. Why would I use that one? So I think it took me like six months before I even put it in my mouth and Same. then I realized when I was sitting in front of a computer for example working oh I'm holding my breath all the time and our brain doesn't like like that so when we think that is my hypothesis when we think for example oh I need to go for a coffee oh I'm exhausted oh I can't I'm stressed out I can't fulfill this task I think to a large extent we have a tendency to hold our breath and when we do obviously we will deprive our brain of oxygen. So the, the oxygen doesn't need coffee or, or, or sugar. It actually needs oxygen. So with, with this, what I have noticed and many others is that it's possible to concentrate a lot longer because the brain will get a steady flow. If you can maintain this rhythmic breathing, instead of changing between holding your breath and then breathing faster and going back and forth like a very bumpy car ride, it's... Uh, uh, really beneficial for the brain. The brain can relax more and then it can stay focused more if it knows that it will get a, a rhythmic flow of its most important nutrient. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah you know, <clears throat> what I've also noticed is that I'm able to extend my XL because you you very eloquently explained why it's important to, to extend the XL. Yeah. And... I learned that I, on average, have about two, sometimes three times the the exhale mm. by doing it through the the relaxator mm. and through my mouth than I do exhaling through my nose. Right. So I would I used to inhale through my nose softly, and and I used to use some of the the cues of like. Um, making sure that if you had a feather in front of your nose that you don't see the mm. feather move. Like this is what I mean by like soft inhale and exhale. Yeah. And I used to do that just nasally. But when I do now my inhale nasally and then my exhale very soft through through the relaxator, mm. um, I mean, it's almost a joke at how long I can exhale. And then I've even toyed around with trying to to do an, an exhale, hold, and then another exhale, mm. hold, and then a soft inhale. And again, I'm I'm an experimenter, like you. Like yeah. I love to experiment. That's you know? how we learn. And, and <laughs> that one, let's just say, was uh, quite interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, quite interesting. So, but besides besides the the uh, being in the parasympathetic response and mm-hmm. and and helpful for recovery with the with the extended exhale, mm-hmm. what other reasons why should someone want to learn how to extend their exhale? What's the point of that? Well, if we want to, it, my view is that probably most likely during evolution, it is not the people that have been able to write poems or admire the sunset that has uh, been most likely to survive. It, it has been those that have uh, been more ready, uh, alert, uh, look out for dangers, L- like our system is, is wired in a way, in, in, in that way. So a favorite example of mine is, if I tell a person hundred nice things, oh, you're lovely, you're beautiful, you're warm hearted, you are this, you are that. And then I say, but you, you smell quite awful. What will we remember then? <laughs> we will remember the last thing, right? Because our system is geared more toward fight flight. So I think we don't have to train so much in producing adrenaline or, or, or looking around for what is, is dangerous. So I think we, we have to train more to, to uh, the recovery, feeling safe and secure. And when we do, and when we realize that we actually get stronger and we may attract less of these situations where we actually need to engage in fight flight. So that that is the key for me, I think. The, the whole, if we look at the whole hum- humanity, we probably need less adrenaline. Uh, we need less fight flight. We need, need less hatred. We, we need more love, more cooperation, more a wide angle, less less tunnel vision. So, so well that said. is, I think, what, what we find in in the exhale, in in my view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, can can you explain a bit? Let's dive into that topic about carbon dioxide and oxygen, and yeah. that's because my, my, the way I think about it is when we the the more we can extend our exhale, mm. the 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 higher our co2 levels start to to raise yeah that's true right and so this is kind of what i see it's like and 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 there's this beautiful balance within a, a balanced person right but there's this beautiful balance between co2 and o2 yeah and when you when you extend your exhale chances are you're raising your co2 levels which should tell the body that we need to get also more oxygen right and I think some people think just getting in air means that they're getting more oxygen, but that's not necessarily the case, right? So maybe you can you can explain that, yeah, or, or it, it, your your view of it anyway. Yeah, like a car, it doesn't go better just because we give it more fuel, right? It needs the exact right amount of fuel, and that varies depending on how fast we go, if we're on the highway or in a rush hour in the city. Etc. And um, I, I think w- what we we don't fully, in general, understand is that we think oxygen is the key. Bring in more, that is better. But actually, w- when we balance up our breathing, we replace quantity with quality, and we restore a balance between oxygen and carbon dioxide. And j- just to finish off uh, the uh, the training there to extend the exhale. Again, I want to stress the fact that it's relaxation that is the key. So when I started off using this, I was way too competitive. I thought I should have the world's best breathing in the shortest period of time. And that does not go hand in hand. Improving your breathing with a competitive state, it just doesn't work like that. So when we talk about extending the exhale, we're talking about doing it in a relaxed way, I I think. If we force it, well, then we will just, as soon as we stop uh, doing the breathing retraining, then we will start to breathe more instead. And, and maybe we will even uh, end up having lower CO2. But, but anyway, the, the idea is that oxygen is the key and carbon dioxide is just a waste product. But j- just like uh, in, in my view, there is nothing that is good and something that is bad. It's always about balance. Oxygen, we should have right amount of, and carbon dioxide, we should have right amount of. And oxygen is great, but it's also a because we, we, we die if we stop breathing, and that's because we're so dependent on oxygen. But 
just as much as we're dependent on it is is both a curse and a blessing actually because too much oxygen gives rise to free radicals free oxygen radicals so if i take a bite in an apple and put it down and then it's exposed to oxygen to to the atmosphere and it will start to uh, turn brown right that's because the apple oxidizes and and when we see metal uh, it's exposed to um, oxygen it starts to rust so if we take in too much oxygen we basically start to rust inside and that's what we call inflammation so that's one part of overbreathing which many of us tend to do breathing too fast and too shallow and too big breaths we take in too much oxygen leading to too much inflammation and then at the same time because if i inhale 10 liter per minute i will also exhale 10 liter per minute and normally the carbon dioxide is, that is produced in our body about four percent of the exhale uh, is made up of carbon dioxide so if a, a normal breath is around six liters per minute and four percent of that that is 240 milliliters per minute that we exhale but if i go up to to 10 liters per minute almost double and four percent co2 of that that is 400 milliliter meaning that we increase oxygen in our body and at the same time we lower co2 in our body when we overbreathe and that is a problem because mm -hmm. co2 is as far in my view as far as as uh, away from a waste product that you can ever come because to start with our breath is our number one bodily function without breathing there is nothing right no thoughts no emotions no muscle movements no nothing so our breath is our number one function and it is controlled by co2 we may think that it's lack of oxygen that controls and, and forces us to take next breath but that is actually the build up of co2 so if co2 the co2 levels control your breathing well then obviously it has to be much more than just a waste product and when you find Sorry. a person that if i'm exaggerating a little bit but breathing too fast too much maybe have the mouth open that person have very low tolerance for co2 so the production which uh, takes place all the time in our body when it just reaches a a, a little more the the breathing center in our brain stem is triggered and uh, the body is told to to inhale and then on the following exhale we will exhale the co2 while and, and, and that could be seen, for example, in a panic attack or an asthma attack or a, a migraine or epileptic seizure. A lot of situations, if you really start to study it, and there are studies confirming this, you would notice that the, the breathing is quite fast. It is hyperventilating, which means that the, the CO2 levels are much lower then. And they have then a low tolerance for CO2. So, for example, if you come to the hospital and have a panic attack, you get a bag to breathe in and out through, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason why that works, you put the bag in front of, of you and normally we exhale about 100 times more CO2 than we inhale. So when you exhale it in the bag, you will rebreathe some of the CO2. So the stressed panic brain that has a, actually lack of blood and oxygen, that's why it's so stressed. And that's why bag breathing works because carbon dioxide doesn't only control breathing it also makes the smooth muscles relax and we have those smooth muscles in our airways and in our blood vessels so the, the person in a panic attack is breathing fast uh, exhaling too much co2 lowering the co2 pressure the airways contract and you may get also an, a feeling of asthma or an asthma diagnosis and your blood vessels contract so you get less blood to your brain so when you breathe into the bag, you will increase the CO2 pressure in your body and the, mm -hmm. the smooth muscles surrounding the blood vessels will open up and the panic brain starved of blood and oxygen will start to, to get more of that. And then it can start to wind down. So this so is then... so important and, and so overlooked and, and so misunderstood the importance of CO2. This is why I think some people talk about the the potential benefits of wearing masks nowadays yeah. right yeah and, and and even the lockdowns because the, we we, uh, we spend more time indoor and since we are carbon dioxide factories 
you if you're a group of people indoors you will you will automatically increase the co2 levels in that atmosphere and the same with wearing a mask but of course if you are not aware of uh, that it could be beneficial and if you are a bit stressed out before going into these things if your co2 tolerance is not that good well then you will actually end up being more stressed by wearing a mask you will start to open your mouth and breathe faster maybe and the same thing with spending more time mm. indoors not normally in the atmosphere we have about 0.04 percent co2 while the levels uh, when we are indoor they may may be uh, tw twice as 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 high or even higher and that means that we are exposed to more co2 and actually the, the co2 is rising as well when we talk about global warming if there is one thing that both sides agree on is that actually the levels of co2 in the atmosphere is increasing so we are exposed to more co2 uh, in the atmosphere more co2 when we're indoors and especially if we're doing lockdowns and also even more if we're wearing a mask but just as it could be beneficial i think for most people it is it is actually more stressful so actually you will end up with all of these things these um, uh, different things we're doing end up being more in activity breathing and more in fight flight that's very fascinating and i think it's a really good point yeah. which which kind of goes back to what you said initially the better you the better you can work and improve your co2 tolerance the better yeah. this inevitable situation we're, we're faced with i think the better it becomes or at least the the chances of your having a good outcome is a lot greater and yeah. this is why i think like because for me it's, it's no problem wearing a mask i mean yeah i don't want anything on my face for long periods of time and you know, I just got through traveling yesterday, two long flights and, you know, being in the airport for basically the whole day, you know, mm -hmm. like on a long yeah. layover and things like that. No one really wants to do that. But no. when you're someone who's been focusing and working through breathing, then it's kind of like, OK, what's next? What, what do you have? What do you, what can you throw at me now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? yeah, um, yeah, that's true. And And I mean, we can't escape the increase in atmosphere. Maybe we can, we don't, I'm not certain it's man-made. Maybe it is, I don't know. But anyway, it is definitely increasing. And when we, we saw that there were lockdowns and activities around the world, including less flights, they were going down. The CO2 levels weren't affected that much. So, so I think the best we can do is to realize that our exposure to CO2 is increasing. And, and today we spend 90% of our time indoors, unfortunately. So we are expo exposed yeah. in, in different areas to more CO2. So we have to try to uh, adopt and, and learn them to tolerate that. And, and actually, as I say, when there is a problem, there is also a solution. So this is actually, in my view, a way for us to help expand our awareness and, and, and grow. That is how I associate the, the increased tolerance for CO2. Because just as we, we we discussed about the person with a panic attack has low levels of CO2 and is in a way in an ultimate stress response, a total panic. While if we look in the opposite direction, a person that is in deep, deep, deep meditation, the main difference between those two states is not whether they have slept well or eaten well, or if they're newly in love or if they lost their job. The main difference is CO2 and breathing. The panic state, low levels of CO2, while the meditative state, the breathing is low and slow and the CO2 retention is high. So CO2 is really our natural tranquilizer. And I, I have experienced it so, so, so many times. Just go out for a jog, for example, do nasal breathing, maybe prolong my exhalation slightly and I can enter into a profound deep meditative state um, it's like or just right. go out for walk walking meditation or running meditation i don't know have, have you experienced that co2 calming effect do you know what i mean what i'm talking about of course absolutely yeah yeah, yeah in mm -hmm. fact um 
I, I, I had it on here somewhere. I wanted to show it. But uh, <laughs> on your website, you, you consciousbreathing.com, <clears throat> the part that says meet Anders Olsen, uh, has the, the you running with, your, with tape over your mouth. And I thought that was really, really cool, um, you know, because it's like it, it, it begs the question, what the hell is he doing? You know, and um, well, there you yeah. go. Yeah, you mean I, I had duct tape over my mouth and ran a, a half marathon. Yeah. 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 Which, you know, it's, it's very impressive. If you're watching this video, you see I have uh, I'm sharing the screen and this is kind of where I got. Uh, a lot of this information about uh, Mr. Anders Olsen and uh, why I wanted to to kind of rattle that off. But um, one of the things I wanted to go back to quickly is when you mentioned the levels of CO2 rising in a in the place that we spend most of our time, 90% of our time, mm -hmm. but also uh, in the environment outdoors, the CO2 levels are rising. Um, I think one of the one of the other cool things that we can do to sort of mitigate not obviously we should be making sure that we um are um learning to deal with co2 much better but you can also take a benefit get some plants that that are good indoor plants and yeah. you can you can let those plants use up that that co2 because plants thrive with co2 and provide yeah. this oxygen right so um you know like i, I think obviously it begs the, it begs the question of okay well then should we try to be in a, a part of the world if you if you're able to live in a part of the world that has a lot of uh nature mm -hmm. because chances are you're going to have better uh oxygen levels and lower co2 levels naturally but then also in our homes um should we have a few plants here and there? Apparently, plants help to kind of cleanse the air, but I think it also benefits uh, by utilizing um, this expended CO2 that's happening all the time. Yeah, no, good point. Yeah. Um, so what else comes to mind? Because, I mean, there's there's so many rabbit holes we can go down. I mean, um, you know, yeah. maybe we can talk about – go ahead. No, I'm curious about uh, your experience with the, the body stream that we have developed, which That's is in line say. with our idea. Yeah, that was what, what you wanted to talk about as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because, okay, so if, if you're listening and following and watching up to this point, you know, we, we just started to kind of talk about this balance of CO2 and O2. And because Anders is a big fan of CO2, uh, it, at least from what I've found out is that you got curious as to how beneficial is CO2 and what can you do to incorporate more CO2 to into the body and on the body and things like that. And so you started to, to experiment with utilizing CO2. And I remember in the book, um, in uh, the book breath, there was a mention of, of learning how to, to utilize a, a small amount of carbon dioxide with a certain amount of oxygen to increase to, to, to get a certain effect. And when that happened, I immediately, the light bulbs went off in my brain and I was like, uh Oh, this is when I think I started to do more research on you and, mm -hmm. and to figure out like, okay, all right. So how are they doing it? I want to get one of those systems. You know, I want to try it myself because, you know, I've been a fan of utilizing oxygen. I've been a fan of utilizing ozone, I've been a fan of utilizing uh, molecular hydrogen. And and so I, it, it's not too far off from what I've already been experimenting with anyway. And I finally was able to, to get my hands on the body stream. Yeah. And for those that don't know the body stream, um, it's this big, this, this suit that, um, that you get into, you, extract the um i'm gonna actually share my screen here you extract the the oxygen and the air within the suit and it's kind of like a scuba diving suit and uh once you extract all the air you then go to uh let me just open this up here yeah so uh i'm here on consciousbreathing.com uh i think we can go to products and you've got the courses here um and here's the body stream so like just imagine being in this like scuba diving type suit and you, you extract all of the air out of it. It's sort of like your vacuum vacuum sealing your body <laughs> and yeah. um, it comes with this nice little vacuum. And yeah. then you, 
then you switch it to to providing full CO2, pharmaceutical grade carbon dioxide, pure carbon dioxide, and you see that the suit kind of inflates because it's sealed around the neck and and everything, right? And so you kind of yeah, hang you, out. You become like and, a Michelin man, yeah. Yeah, like the Michelin man, exactly. Yeah. And um, I've been doing this now for for quite some time. Uh, they've got a couple different sizes of suits. And uh, I've been doing this now, I think I've done about 15 sessions. Okay. And I've learned to kind of um, time it out. And, and of course, we'll let you explain all of this and what it does. But my experience, just so you know quickly, is at about... I'd say approximately 20 minutes. Well, for, okay, first of all, for, for the first 10 minutes, I feel this warming sensation, yeah. particularly around the vital organs. So like my crotch oh. area and yeah. my abdomen. Um, and then a lot again, of I had to tinker. crotch area, actually. Most people yeah. say that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it, it, it's really kind of like... I wouldn't say necessarily tingling, but kind mm. of tingling. It just feels like it's warm, warming up. Mm. And um, I was listening to, I was, I was reading some stuff, I think on the, the frequently asked questions. And basically the, the thought there was that your, your circulation is increasing. So, okay, that's a huge mm. benefit. We want to make sure that we are increasing the circulation throughout the entire body, but especially around the vital organs, right? Yeah. So when this is happening, I don't freak out. I kind of think like, oh, okay, this is, this is nice. Um, I will admit for the person out there that might be slightly claustrophobic, the first 10 minutes could be challenging because, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're, you're sealed around the neck. You're in this big suit. You're like, wait, carbon dioxide, is this normal? Like, am I supposed to feel like this? I just assure everyone it's fine. It's, it's all good, you know, because then at about the 20 minute mark, almost every single time I do it at around 20 minutes, I just become the most relaxed person. It's like I fight to keep my eyes open. Yeah. It's like I, I, I take a nap almost every, I think yeah. out of the 15 times I've done it, I've, mm. I've not taken a nap two times. One oh, of those yeah. times is because I was recording a video. The other time was because I was, um, I was, uh, uh, I think I was watching a documentary and I was very engaged mentally, okay. but, um, I typically do a one hour session, approximately mm -hmm. one hour. And, um, it's pretty cool because even though the, the body stream is sealed, the, um, you lose this Michelin man look towards the end of the session. And I think that's because the body is absorbing the CO2, right? Yeah. That's kind of what I think. Um, also I go into it with, with clothes on like normal because the, the the skin can still absorb it um mm. the co2 that is and yeah i just i finish after once i finish i think the toughest part is getting it ar uh, around my head and my hair because i've got all this hair you yeah know? i don't um, have that problem luckily <laughs> <laughs> right um but you know what i've been doing is just trying to to i also utilize the the relaxator while i do it I mean, not the okay. whole time, but I, no. I do it in the beginning because again, it's, if, if I, I'm not a claustrophobic person, but in the beginning, when this, when this is happening, I kind of take an opportunity to relax even more. Yeah. And yeah. maybe that's the reason why I end up going to sleep in, in around 20 minutes, but, um, it's, it's profound. And one thing I've seen is my sleep has dramatically improved. Mm. Okay. Now I will say, uh, I'm not just doing the body stream. I'm doing a lot of other things, right? Sure, sure. Um, and the what I mean by this by my sleep drastically improving, dramatically improving, is not the 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 length of time, but the quality of sleep. And so I'm fortunate enough to have the the aura ring, and I have my Garmin, and there's mm -hmm. a few other things that I use to kind of track my sleep. But previously, I used to notice that there was always gaps in my sleep of moments when I wasn't necessarily cognitively awake, like consciously awake, mm -hmm. but my devices would register as me being awake or not in deep sleep. Yeah. And it would be, I'd say on average about nine times a, a night mm -hmm. and throughout a, you know, seven hour, eight hour period. Now it's like straight through no, no, no spikes, none, wow. zero, wow. maybe, maybe one. 
Like, you know, and that could be from, you know, a number of things, right? And again, it's not to say that we shouldn't wake up and go pee or, you know, whatever. It's just that I feel like my body is is utilizing that time of me being asleep to do all the things it needs to do. Glymphatic yeah. utilization in the brain, um, lymphatic drainage throughout the body, um, recovery from stressful events mentally or stressful events physically. All yeah. of these things are happening now and my body's not having to wake up. Yeah. <laughs> so that's my experience. Yeah, and, and I think that's great. If anyone have read the Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker, you would know that sleep is so important for brain function and brain uh, organization and, and cleaning while asleep. And as we talked about before, the, the book Breath by James Nestor, when we did that study at Stanford, and we did 10 days uh, with uh, blocked nose so we could only breathe through our mouth. We, we got affected in many ways, but the, the main, the major thing was to sleep. I, mm. I think I slept on average, uh, snored on average three hours per night. So we filmed ourselves when we slept and we recorded the sound and it went so far that I even didn't want to go to sleep without, because I knew it's going to be a horrible experience. I know. I'm going to get restless sleep. I'm going to get twist and turn. My mouth will be dry as a desert. I will wake mm -hmm. up uh, five or six times. And I will, when I wake up in the morning, I will just be exhausted. So it was such a, a what we realize, and there are studies confirming this, the, the very close relationship between breathing and the deep sleep. If we have mouth breathing, for example, if we breathe through mouth, while sleeping, we will automatically enter more into the, um, sorry, uh, when we, um, there is this profound effect, this close connection between poor breathing and poor sleep. So if we do mouth breathing, for example, while sleeping, we will automatically move towards activation, towards fight flight. And that is not where we're supposed to be if we want to have right. deep sleep, if we want to have rest and recovery. So that is why uh, in that study, uh, after 10 days of mouth breathing, we did the opposite. So we did conscious breathing. We, we taped our mouth at night and it was really like turning a hand. The sleep returned immediately, the good sleep. I can still remember that the next day I woke up and finally with my mouth tape had a good night's sleep. I, I mean, I was so energetic. My energy was... 11, I think, from our scale from 1 to 10. Uh, I couldn't stop smiling. I couldn't stop seeing. I was just uh, in a really harmonious state. So uh, that is interesting that it, because breathing and CO2 is also so closely related, right? The mouth breathing mm -hmm. lowers the CO2 mm -hmm. level. So when you say that you get really relaxed, you fall asleep in the body stream, that is what the majority of people that have tried it say. And, and we see that they get super relaxed and they get uh, they, they they get to sleep when they get into this suit and and i i think co2 is our natural tranquilizer in a way as we discussed before about the um, the uh, panic attack versus the meditation and uh, uh, my first experience when i really realized the power of co2 as a um, way to calm down was uh, when I did my first what I call carbon dioxide training. I went out for a jog one hour and I did only nasal breathing. And I tried to take as many steps on the exhale as possible and as few as possible on the inhale. And I tried to push myself to the point where I always felt, no, I can only do two more breaths or, or five more steps. Then I have to breathe faster. But I I'm, I'm quite persistent, so I continued to do it uh, for the whole hour. So I took maybe two, three steps on the inhale and, and between six and eight steps, I think, on the exhale. It depended a little bit if it was uphill or downhill, etc. Mm -hmm. But it, it was really, really tough. But when I came home, then I got the reward. I sat down at the kitchen table and I felt really harmonious. And three hours later, I still found myself sitting there just looking around, basically wondering where <laughs> are the angels? <laughs> like it was a, a really wow. profound experience. Yeah. So that's I kind of what we try to mimic with this, with this suit too bad uh, that. Um, 
It's great. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, I think it works really well. In fact, I think something that's important to note when when you, you touched on it briefly about uh, mouth breathing while sleeping, if you yeah. find yourself being very thirsty and things like that, yeah. uh, that was, I was like that. Not all the time, but yeah. I always had to have a bottle of water by my bed. Right. And it and it wasn't like I would get up in the middle of the night to to drink, but in the morning, yeah. there would be, I would just have this sensation in my mouth that I just wanted to get rid of. And I recall like using, uh, I used to have like this specified morning routine that I would always wake up, gargle with, um, with uh, a, a, a small like diluted hydrogen peroxide mix. <laughs> and I would, um, I would gargle with that, yeah. you know, spit it out to get a, the bacteria out of the mouth. And then I would drink the, the rest of the solution, you know, carbon uh -huh. or um, hydrogen peroxide. Right. Yeah. And there's, there's some, some good therapies with doing that and reasons for that. But what I was mostly doing was trying to get rid of the bacteria in the mouth because I was thinking, well, I've got, you know, dry mouth, I've got cotton mouth every morning. So I need to get rid of it. Now yeah. I don't even, I don't even take water to the room anymore. No, I, I, do, I don't even need to, because when I wake up, I mean, yes, there's still like, um, you know, a film inside the mouth, but it's not dry mouth anymore because I'm no. not breathing through my mouth. And that's what is really important with um, when it comes to breathing properly while sleeping. And I think anybody that experiences the same thing that I was just explaining, give this sleep tape thing a try because, you know, it doesn't require a big piece of tape like you saw when the image I just showed with Anders with the duct tape. It doesn't require that. It just no. requires just enough to engage the, the 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 lips to shut. That's it. Yeah. And if so. you find it very uh, scary, well, I mean, at the end of the day, conscious breathing that I teach, it's about reducing unnecessary stress. So if you find it very stressful, uh, then don't do it. But you, you, what you can do if you want to tape at night then is to start doing it for a few evenings to, to until you get used to the sensation and then try it at night because it is a skill you can learn, you can train. It's, it's just a, a mental blockage. Um, and I mean, when I started recommending this 10 years ago, it was a bit awkward and uh, I kind of like, yeah, but at least please give it a try now it's starting to really become a a huge trend and i mean i i'm not the inventor of this of course there has been many before me recommending this but it's really starting to take off it's such an easy biohack and and i mean a lot of people they have actually got their life changed because sleep is so profound and if you could start i, I mean we've all uh, experienced lack of sleep or poor sleep and then the next day we may not make the, the best food choices. We may skip the exercise. We may end up in conflicts with, at work or with our loved ones because sleep is, is so crucial. So if you can turn that around, you can start to, to uh, turn around a vicious cycle and, and start to exercise more. Maybe you will have more energy to cook good food or whatever. Well said. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that's a really good point. Like, like it's, it's, Sometimes we forget that we need energy. Our cells need powerful mitochondria to be able to to, to power all the systems throughout the body. But yeah. thinking is one of those one of those systems, and we 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 don't have an infinite amount of decision making skills, right? Um, so, like, there's this thing called decision decision making fatigue that mm -hmm. happens with all these decisions we have to make throughout the day. And that beca that becomes stressful so yeah. much so that sometimes you just go with the easiest thing that's in front of you or that you have access to. And that could be the, the candy bar that could be the soda that could be the whatever, cause it's easy. Yeah. But when you, when you are less stressed throughout the day, then everything kind of becomes easier. And that's Indeed, I think, yeah. That's important. Yeah. 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 I think so too. Yeah. So, all right, so we've got we've we've discussed the relaxator, we've discussed um, the body stream, yeah. we've discussed the sleep tape. What else 
what else would you like to discuss? Because, mm-hmm. you know, I know you, you're definitely someone like, like me that just loves to experiment. And I know you have a things that I don't know, like what you're able to speak about that you have on the horizon. But uh, you and I, when we spoke on the phone, and we did not record, uh, we yeah. talked about a number of things that I'm super excited about. And, um, yeah. and we also have some similarities in that both of our fathers, you know, your father, unfortunately, has has passed. Uh, yeah. My father is currently in the hospital, but I, yeah. I can relate to the advice that you were giving me about my father, because I know it comes from a place of of pain. And I think you at one point felt like, you know, if you knew then what you know now, you possibly could have helped to extend your dad's life a little bit longer. And that's what I'm faced with as we speak. You know, it's like, as soon as we get off, I'm going to the hospital. My dad fell out of the hospital bed today for some reason. And, um, you know, and it's like, I couldn't wait to get here. I just got here last night. I couldn't wait to get here to be able to get him this relaxator and to be right. able to help him through it. And that's what we're going to do today. So I'm not going to, my goal is not to look back and think, Oh, I wish I had, I'm going to do it right now. You know? Yeah. So, awesome. uh, so yeah. So let's talk about some of these other things that, that, that are on the horizon. Yeah. Okay. So we have a couple of other products um, uh, in the pipeline. One is the carbohaler, which instead of absorbing the CO2 through the skin, you inhale, you, you put a mask on and you inhale the carbon dioxide. And just uh, it's important to point out, you said you had done 15 sessions and just as with everything, we can overdose, right? That, that could be, it's about balance. So for example, if I use the relaxator for seven hours, I could be like a machine. I can concentrate very well and do get a lot of work done. But I also noticed that it sometimes comes with a price and that could be, for example, a sugar craving. So I guess what I'm doing then, I'm mm-hmm. overdoing it. And uh, if you uh, just pay attention to, so you're not using the, the body stream suit too much uh, uh, because it's about balance. And and the same with this yeah. carbohaler, then when you inhale the CO2, uh, we should pay attention to, because normally we inhale 0.04 percent right that's not a lot so with this device you can inhale one percent two percent and even more so we recommend to if you start using it to do it very slowly but it's not mm-hmm. uh, uh, we haven't launched it yet but we are about hopefully in uh, yeah a few weeks or a couple of months and what we see so far is that it has a great effect on the airways because the CO2 makes the smooth muscles relax. So in these times, uh, when, when the people have a lot of focus on uh, airway issues, lung issues, it could be great to uh, inhale some CO2 to uh, relieve the tensions and, and to help open up the lungs, the, the airways, so that you can get the air circulating and that you can start to uh, improve the, um, uh, the oxygenation. And on, uh, another interesting thing is that the nose is connected to the brain, right? You have from the nose, it's almost directly connected to the amygdala, uh, which is our fear center in the hippocampus, which is our short term memory. So it's, it's likely that it will affect the, the nervous system as well. Uh, so it's really interesting. We're in the early, early days. There had, has been a, uh, some pioneers before uh, doing this so we're uh, we're looking at them studying them and then we learn developing these protocols so that's one device the other device we're developing is the breath key which is really really interesting you also put on a mask and then it analyzes your breath it analyzes your oxygen molecules and your carbon dioxide molecules which means that you will be able to get an understanding of your metabolism is it high or is it low do you burn sugar or do you burn fat? And then you will be also able to understand basically what is the price of eating a pizza or, or drinking three Coca-Cola if you measure before and, and after. And, and you can then see what's going on in your body with the metabolism. And you really, since, since you're analyzing the breath, it, it can't be any better than that. The quality on the in data is, is really super high and also this device analyzes your breathing rate and your breathing frequency and your breathing rhythm. So 
you will be able to combine this data and we hope to be able to see that when you're angry you have a breath pattern or when you have asthma you have a, a breath pattern so over time when we collect this data we will be able to see that actually a breath would be like a, a fingerprint a breath print so I love that, that. that's really exciting i would have wanted i wanted that from day one when i started with breeding instead of me just saying hey i think maybe you could a, a benefit from changing your breathing to being able to show to people here you see on on your mobile phone or on on a computer that this is how you breathe when you talk or when you uh, try to solve a sudoku or when you watch an action movie or, or etc right so that is really exciting oh, I, yeah. I am so thrilled for that i i cannot wait to to try to you know utilize that somehow so i'm, I'm yeah. anxiously awaiting that one um yeah. so something comes to mind though and i know i know we discussed this when you were yeah. telling me about the breath key um is is the the lumen device right so you know about yeah. the lumen device yeah. okay and so um for the last let's say three four weeks i'd say about four weeks mm -hmm. i've been using this particular um sodium bicarbonate out of uh out of australia it's an amazing um very clean it's called trona sodium bicarbonate and so it's supposed mm -hmm. to be like super clean no metals and things like that right so mm -hmm. I've been util utilizing that and I went through a loading period and then now I sip on it every day, right? But like a small amount every single day. And yeah. then in fact, I have it here. This is what I have inside. Uh -huh. um, and <laughs> it's, it's amazing, right? Uh, so obviously when you know certain things about sodium bicarbonate and what it can do, it helps to make the body uh, more alkaline. Um, and it, there's a lot of upstream effects and benefits you can get from that, right? But mm -hmm. What I noticed is that my lumen score has decreased dramatically. So mm -hmm. I used to be in like the 17%, uh, which for those who don't know about the lumen scoring and things like that, like 17% is pretty good on a, a lumen score. Now I'm down to about 10%. And the thing is, is I know that lumen measures carbon dioxide, CO2, when when you do your breath out if if it recognizes carbon dioxide it thinks that the body is burning sugar right mm -hmm. and if it's measuring more oxygen the body's burning more fat that's i think how they they kind of okay. boil yeah. it down yeah so i i'm just curious because the breath key like i would love to know like if it's going to be kind of the same or not because you know it's mm -hmm. not like i'm drinking this and then I go and do my measurement, you know, no. I do, however, drink my sodium bicarbonate at night before I go to bed so that, so I'm benefiting from this, this, um, alkalinity, this alkaline state while I'm asleep. I think that's yeah. another reason why my sleep has gotten so much better because I don't have food. I make sure to, to not eat anything three hours before bed. So that's another mm. big thing that I've done. I've yeah, done the body stream. Well. Yeah. Right. So, so with body stream relaxator, three hours of no eating before bed and taking now my sodium bicarbonate, that's kind of my stack before yeah. sleep. Right. Yeah. And it's, everything has improved except my lumen score has dr dramatically decreased. Although physiologically, like my aesthetics, I am getting very, very ripped. <laughs> In fact, uh -huh. so strong, <laughs> I'm losing, I'm losing fat. So I'm just curious, like, do you know, like, w will the breath key be able to kind of suss that situation out? Because I think the lumen might be lacking in terms that it, it recognizes carbon uh, sodium bicarbonate as mm. CO2, I think. I think. Yeah. Do you know yeah. about that with the breath key? Like, do you, have, you, have you studied that? Yeah, I, I mean, you will, you will be able to get a really nice picture since you can also combine... You, you you measure the the particles the, the CO2 and and uh, oxygen molecules and then when you combine so so that in that aspect you you get a an idea of your metabolism and then when you combine that with your breathing frequency and breathing rhythm and breathing volume you will get a more complete picture I think it, it's I think like so too. 
Yeah, it's like if you measure oxygen saturation and and you think you you can determine whether you have good or poor breathing just based on that, that is very one dimensional. So, so uh, in order to to understand better, I, I think that is my I know I'm biased, but that is my hope that it will be able to provide uh, more data to make it easier to understand and 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 of course you can combine the data like we I talked this morning with a Alzheimer researcher in in Canada who um, uh, d discussed about measuring the brain waves a, a device he has and when mm -hmm. you start to combine these data things starts to become really really interesting I love it well yeah. I, I definitely want to to kind of uh, combine and compare and see, because I, I'll be honest, like the, the Lumen device was a, a big, uh, a, a big to, tool or resource that I use. Mm -hmm. I've been using it for quite some time with my clients. And yeah. if nothing else, it, it just allows for more awareness, right? Yeah, And indeed. I, I'll yeah. admit, I was such a, I'm so competitive with myself that I wanted to, I wanted to get that number as high as I could. And yeah. if I, if I wake up with anything beyond a two, I would be kind of like, you know, so does that mean I do more fasting? Cause I fast, I do intermittent fasting every day. Yeah. But I think to your point is I want to get the full picture. I want to see the breath rate. I want to see the, the, the measurable carbon dioxide, the measurable oxygen. Yeah. And I think this, this device is going to be, the breath key is going to be, I think a bit more useful. So yeah, hopefully we can get yeah. that soon. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully that that's my hope too. And and another thing, there are studies showing that, as as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, that we hope to be able to see when you are angry or if you're afraid. Uh, that there are studies showing that we have different breathing for different emotions. And I honestly think that is where the key lies to improving our health and and life in general. The things that scares us the most, I think they hold the key for most of us. The things we don't want to go to, the, the childhood traumas or whatever we have experienced that we avoid like the plague. I think that that holds the key to our to growing and expanding the most. And I come to view it more and more. The breath is a way for, for many of us to take the elevator down from our brain into our body and I think it can help us open the door to dare to to face those fears, to face those traumas, big or small, and to uh, help us to uh, to deal with them and maybe solve them, dissolve them, overcome them. So, so that is where I'm leaning towards more and more. The breath is a a path, a, a way, a tool to get into uh, those emotions and and help us to. Uh, you know, love ourselves more or whatever. And and one way of looking at it is the um, oxygen is the male energy. That is something that comes from the outside. And, and today we have a tendency to focus, oh, you're not breathing very well. Well, let's force in some oxygen uh, with a ventilator while carbon dioxide is the more female energy inviting the oxygen in telling hey uh, let's take a new breath so we take in some new uh, oxygen and then let's open up the airways so the oxygen can enter into the lungs and then let's open up the blood vessels so that the oxygen can travel out in the body and then finally which is called the bore effect carbon dioxide helps to offload the oxygen from the hemoglobin in the blood so it can enter into the cells. And that. if we look at today's society, I would say that it's more male oriented, more uh, fight flight oriented, more short term focus, while uh, the female energy is, is more um, on the rise and it, it's, it coincides with the rise of CO2 and the female energy is more long term i think it's more cooperating if we just think about a, a child our job is over in you know three seconds or, or three minutes or whatever the, the woman she should carry the child for nine months and then give birth and then breastfeeding so i think the female entity has a more long-term perspective and 
that is what I hope that we are going in that direction. And uh, I think that is what we need. That what we need. We need less of the adrenaline, less of of the uh, male-dominated structures, and and more of the long-term. Uh, uh, I mean, not either or, not either male or female, but a balance between the two. Beautifully put. Um, I think one of the main takeaways from from everything we've been discussing, at least in, in my perspective, is um, we need to stop thinking of CO2 as a waste product and 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 think of it more as a as a part of the overall picture. And yeah. um, and and I love how you explain the Bohr effect, because that's what I was alluding to early on in this conversation. I wanted to talk about, yeah. you know, how important the CO2 is in allowing the the body to offload or to kind yeah. of unbind oxygen right yeah. and so it's it's when you when you have more co2 there there's chances are there's a better ability for the body to utilize or unbind the oxygen that's been kind of pinned up in the cells yeah Beca because it's not only about having you check your oxygen saturation and you see oh i have good saturation well that just means how much oxygen you have in your blood but we want it to enter into our cells so the way i explain it is if you move this muscle your your biceps obviously the metabolism will increase and then you will produce more co2 and this co2 will then leave the muscle and uh, uh, reach the blood and there uh, when it reaches the blood it will signal to the oxygen to go the opposite way so this muscle that is moving needs a lot more oxygen compared to my other arm that is still. So there, my other arm that is still doesn't produce as much CO2. So obviously not as much oxygen is offloaded. So, I mean, our body is just super smart. It's amazing. Yeah. And, and speaking of the exercise and the muscles and things like that, this is why uh, it's important, at least for me, like I, I utilize uh, this, this buildup of nitric oxide via the, mm. uh, blood flow restriction or blood flow moderation yeah, because of that very concept, you know? So maybe, maybe what, you can quickly talk about Japanese, that. What's the Japanese word? Ka the ka katsu. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Katsu. Yeah. I use the katsu bands, but there's, there's so many out there. Katsu, I think is in my opinion, one of the best because, mm the 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 fact that it has a training mode and a cycle mode and the cycle mode is important because the cuffs inside the bands mm -hmm. they inflate for a certain period of time and then they deflate completely and then they inflate again but a little bit higher and then it deflates completely and then it in inflates even more and it keeps stepping it up through about eight cycles and that would be one full round or one full cycle. And what that does is it teaches the blood vessels to be able to expand and to, you know, and to, and then constrict and expand. And it basically, it's like training your blood vessels to, mm -hmm. to be prepared for better circulation. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the other benefit is when you put it in training mode and you just lock it in at one certain uh, cuff pressure, then what you're doing is you're, you're, allowing for the arterial flow to still occur. So you're not completely constricting it, but you are allowing the arterial flow to happen into the body, into the muscles, but you're reducing or moderating the flow, the venous flow, the venous return. And so you end up getting this pooling effect of the, of the blood pooling into the limbs, depending on where you attach it. But if you, if you feel your your arms almost like swelling up your mm -hmm. your biceps your your forearms your hands what you notice is is that when you press the palm of your hand it's called a capillary refill time you can see just how quickly your circulation has improved just by simply cuffing the arms for a moment yeah. and what ends up happening is is once you take the cuff off after about 15 minutes or so doing mm -hmm. a workout of whatever moderate intensity uh, you don't need heavy weights, but you take off that cuff, you now have this new set of oxygen, oxygenated blood kind of occurring throughout the entire body. It's an, a, a systemic effect because mm -hmm. nitric oxide comes in to try to open up those blood vessels because it, it thinks there's a problem. That yeah. to me is very powerful. So you combine that with things like the body stream, things like sodium bicarbonate, things like, you know, uh, uh, learning how to work with the relaxator to improve your, your breathing. Like 
these things are a culmination of of things right. you can do to help yourself. Yeah, and and do you also think that restricting the blood flow has a carbon dioxide effect? Be because what they say is right that it should restrict the, the venous return. So, so if you look at the muscle, the muscle, yes. uh, you deliver oxygen to the muscle, the mitochondria produces energy and CO2 is produced. But if you're restricting the venous uh, return of the blood, there will be some uh, increase of CO2 in this area then. Do you Bingo. think Bingo. that, that uh, could contribute to the effect? Uh, of course. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I yeah. think the the CO2 and the nitric oxide are kind of synonymous when it yeah. comes to the the effect at least in in terms of like the BFR training or blood flow restriction training. Yeah. Um very much so. And I think a lot of people look at more the nitric oxide component because of the 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 need to dilate the blood vessels versus mm -hmm. looking at the CO2, but of course I think you and I would look at the CO2 side of it because we know how important that is. So I think it yeah. goes hand in hand. Yeah, I think so too. And, and as we know, it's it, the body is quite complex. So it's not just one thing. There are tons of things that contribute to health or, or uh, disease. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because I mean, the way I think of it is if the venous flow is being moderated or slightly restricted, then yeah. the signals, the signal, uh, you know, to the lungs, to the heart, to the, you know, to the, to the cells is that there there's not enough oxygen and there's yeah. this buildup of of carbon dioxide so it's just yeah. like breathing you know it's, it's just like yeah moderating that, your breathing <laughs> yeah that's exactly how I, I explain it as well when you go into the body stream and you start to absorb co2 through the skin when there is excess co2 the body will perceive it as hey there is lack of oxygen we have to direct blood to that area so yeah bingo bingo yeah. Well said. Um, awesome. And this has been fun, man. This has been fun. Yeah, I know really it's. Fun. Uh, we are at uh, easily at, at ninety minutes, um, and I think we could have gone three hours, four hours, five hours. But I think um, you know what, what I would like to do, if you're okay with it, is what I normally do when I have a guest on the show is I always ask them two questions, yeah. and uh, and these two questions I think are it's more about um, getting to know you as a person. Mm -hmm. and uh and feel free to throw it back at me if you need to or want to so that it's yeah. also part of your interview as well but um yeah. the first question i like to ask is what are your top two pet peeves what are what are what are two things that you can think of that kind of get under your skin that that annoy you a little bit about life in general it doesn't have to be about your work it can be but what are what are your top two pet peeves two top things that annoy me yeah yeah like if you want i can give you an example so that you know we we, we sort of uh we get the, the interview side of it kicked at me i can i mean for me it's almost always the same but um i can rattle mine off if you want to think about yours for a moment yeah yeah okay, okay. so, so, so um, let, let me ask you then so uh Yes. So, so uh, Josh, can you tell me what, what are the two things that annoy you most in life? Okay. So there, okay. I want to be the, the type of person that says, oh, nothing annoys me. And I, I, I breathe through everything and everything is, you know, life is amazing, which is true, yeah. right? I think life is what we, what we make it. Okay. That being said, there are some things that get under my skin. Uh, things that would be known as pet peeves here. And one of the first ones that comes to mind, and I don't even know why, I'm trying to not allow this to annoy me so much, but it's loud chewing, loud <laughs> chewing, smacking. We, we, we call it smacking, right? So yeah. if I'm sitting across from, from someone trying to have a conversation, I promise you, I promise you, I cannot hear anything they're saying, or if I do hear them, I can't process anything they're saying if they're doing this. I, it drives me up a wall. And yeah. there's, actually, there's actually a term for this, the people who, who are sensitive to loud noises when it comes to eating. Um, mm -hmm. I forget what it's called, uh, but that's definitely one of my pet peeves. 
Um, and I, I associate that with a, just a lack of awareness, lack of situational awareness or a lack mm-hmm. of care of, 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 of how you are being perceived or whatever. And I just kind of think like it just goes back to manners and it goes back to, um, you know, wanting to treat others the way you would like to be treated and things like that. And so mm-hmm. um, I almost prefer sometimes to just meet with people without eating. Because, you know, and I, I practice intermittent fasting and things like that. But if you're yeah. someone that is around me and we we happen to to meet up and we eat, please just just tone it down because I won't even be able to hear what you're saying. <laughs> so that's one of mine. Uh, my other one would another one would be. Um, I would say laziness, laziness mm-hmm. and, and, and laziness is is not always just you know this lack of motivation to 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 exercise or lack of motivation to to clean the house or whatever i think laziness is also comes to the mentality of a person you know and so sometimes we we just don't engage in in wanting to to research something or wanting to read something or um you know we give so much information today and and especially like on my platform i know you give it on your platform but can you imagine that there's some people who follow me who still don't know that like I I'm writing a book and I'm talking about people who claim that they follow me. Oh, Josh, I love your work. I'm this and that. Oh, you're writing a book. Oh, you, you have a podcast. Oh, oh, you have a YouTube channel. Yeah. Oh, you're on Instagram. It's like, hello. To me, that's just lazy. That's just this this lack of not wanting to, you know, like, like the, in, the research I did before this show. I've talked to you before. I've done research on you before, but I I wanted to make sure that I'm well prepared for this conversation today. And mm. let's you know, just sometimes you just have to have the initiative, whether it be work, life, you know, career, relationships, with family, with loved ones. Like, just don't be lazy. That's a that's a big pet peeve of mine. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And so, let me throw it at you now. Yeah. Your turn. <laughs> right. So for me, I would say that one thing that I find a bit disturbing is the lack of curiosity, the attitude that I have figured it all out, that I am rigid in my mind. This is what I, what I was taught 30 years ago, and it's still valid. I'm not open to any change. Get out of my way. This is the way to do it. I think we miss so much. It's like, you know, die without being kissed if we continue to be uh, uh, less curious. That so, is a great one. Yeah. That's a great one. Yeah, that's, that, that's very similar to my, my laziness one. Yeah, I, it I is. I think you're yeah, 100% right. It goes hand in hand. Yeah, it really does. Yeah, well said. And so. the other one for me is the the attitude the the misunderstanding that it is a that life is a competition the to not understand that we're all in this together that if i make a poor decision it may affect you three years from now so that first and foremost we should help each other to grow and evolve it's not to point finger and say oh what a stupid person yeah but that stupid person may drink too much alcohol and and jump in the car and drive you over so then it doesn't really matter if you have sorted uh, all your stuff out and and live a perfect life in perfect health if someone else is not living um, being healthy or or mentally or emotionally or, or physically so i find that disturbing that that we don't see that hey we we need to help each other that that could be so, well so easy to just just change that attitude instead of we may go around and think oh at least i'm better than that person so yeah that feels good <laughs> dude that's that's very powerful yeah thank you for for the, for both of those i think again yeah. a lot of times the the pet peeve conversation can be viewed as a negative but the yeah. reason why i like to bring it up is because I, I know that there, there, there's ways to to make it a positive. 
And what you yeah. just, those two that you just, you just mentioned, both of those are really important ways for us to just be better in general, be better people in general. Yeah. Because yeah. True. If we can adapt, identify if, a problem, realize yeah. that, Hey, I have this issue. Awareness is usually the first step towards making a change. But when you first post a question, Hmm, this was an unusual question. I'm not used to that. Hmm. Uh, can I even answer? Uh, do I have an answer? But yeah, after some thought, yeah, <laughs> really great. Absolutely. Question. Thank you. And you know, I, I, I will say one more thing. The, my book is called the awareness shift because mm -hmm. of that very reason. And wow. Wow. it's, it's about just diving in more within mm -hmm. ourselves to find out what, what can we do to help ourselves so that we can mm -hmm. in turn help humanity. He, you know, yeah. we, at the end of the day, we're all one. We all have to, yeah. sit, we, all, we all have to live on this same planet. Right. And so if something's happening negatively in, 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 um, Australia or Africa or, or Asia, then we are affected as well. And it may not be yeah. Josh and Anders, but it might be our children. It might be their children. It might yeah. be, you know, so on and so forth. So anyway, uh, it's easy to get very esoteric there, but, um, nonetheless, yeah. the, the, the last question I like to ask is usually a more positive one. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's also something that I feel like we should all do more of is, is engaging with, uh, this question. And that question is, what is something you are most grateful for? I am most grateful for my journey, being able to grow and being able to realize that I'm not slave under these learned programs that got installed into my system when I was a child. And uh, they got installed because that was needed at the time. But for me, and I think for a lot of people, when as we grow up, we start to realize that a lot of those programs, they are not true. They take us in the wrong direction. They uh, don't get us where we want, and they may uh, stop us from getting what we want, uh, loving relationships or, or a nice job or whatever. And that realization that, okay, I have these programs. When I look myself in the mirror, I see when someone pushed that button, I react in, in, uh, with that emotion or whatever and realize that, hey, I don't have to react like that. I can react differently. Mm -hmm. And owning that and starting to, to change that, starting to upgrade, just like any computer program that gets upgraded over and over again, I think we have the ability to upgrade these programs. Basically, we just have this hard drive here. We take up the Word document and we read it and we see, oh, I don't like it. So I just upgrade it and then I store it back. So, so that has been, that is what I think I'm, I'm most grateful for. And that, that goes hand in hand with the curiosity, actually. Who am I? And, and uh, is this set in stone? Do I have to be like this until I die? Or is there something else around the corner that can be uh, uh, discovered, improved, or done differently? Beautiful. Again, thank you for that. Um, you know, yeah, thank, thank you, you John. And, I, and if I throw it back to you, then the same question. Uh, this one is, is is very easy for me. I, I try not to allow it to be the same every time that I'm asked something like this. But um, I'm, I'm grateful for my family, mm -hmm. which would be, you know, even people consider just friends, but I consider them my family. So I'm, I'm grateful for my family, for my very close friends, for my clients, mm -hmm. and for this, this situation that allows me to be me truthfully, mm -hmm. to, that mm -hmm. allows me to be my authentic self around certain people. And, and, and it's pretty simple to, to point out those that I cannot be myself around are those that I spend less time with, you know? Yeah. Um, and so it, it's basically, I guess it can be boiled down into one word. I'm, I'm grateful for my support, for this yeah. support structure, because, you know, to be our, our, our authentic selves is very important. And, you know, it's like, I can talk very big picture, big vision, you know, things like, Hey, I want to, I want to 
uh, start my own business. I want to do my own certification. I want to do, and the people who are really supporting me and know mm. me true, truthfully inside and out are the people that go, okay, when are you getting started? But then mm. you've got people who aren't quite there yet who are like, oh, that's how, you can't do that. How do you do that? Well, what about, it's like, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for my tribe. I'm looking for my my family, my my people, and I'm just grateful for those that are that I would consider to be in that in that group. So, um, thank you for that. Beautiful, <laughs> um, wonderful. I love it. <laughs> yeah, and then I think obviously for today, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for um, all that you've brought to sort of my world, but also to the lives and the minds of many other people out there. I mean, your work is very, very profound and important. Um, I would love for you to let listeners and viewers know where they can find out more about you and, and your company and, and, and things you have coming in the future. Yeah. So consciousbreeding.com is the website. And we're also on Instagram and Facebook and YouTube and it's conscious breathing. Easy, easy. I yeah. will, I will definitely link to that in the uh, show description, and um, when we post this on the social media channels and things like that, I'll, I'll obviously tag you and the company. Um, and yeah, um, and, unless there's anything yeah, else, let me ask you the same then, Josh. I, I think I'm, okay. I'm really pre- appreciate your sharing your experience and your vast knowledge with the world and help it to become a better place. And and how do people? find more about uh, more about you yeah thank thank you for that opportunity i, I keep forgetting that we're we're doing a, a, a duo interview here <laughs> um <laughs> but yes people people can find me pretty much anywhere with uh using the 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 word joshua j holland j-o-s-h-u-a-j-h-o-l-l-a-n-d so that's Instagram at Joshua J. Holland, my website, joshuajholland.com. Um, and then pretty much any other social media platform, that's where you can find me. Also, mm-hmm. this, uh, this podcast platform I use is called Simply Walk the Talk. And, mm-hmm. um, and that's what you're viewing this on or listening to this on. And uh, yeah, if you, know, if you need to reach out to me, you want to reach out to me, I'm pretty easy going. And as long as it doesn't take up too much of my time, I'm always happy to, to chat with people. Um, and yeah, that's me in a nutshell. Awesome. Yeah. All so, right. Cool. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you to the listeners and the viewers. Um, Peace and love. Anders, thank you. Yes. We will thank talk you. very soon and stay tuned for uh, breathing. Don't forget to relax, <laughs> relax. <laughs> Walk okay, I'm okay. this here. Move Cheers. like me, but I'm moving right. a little fast. Make my move here to last. Fasten these seat belts, I'm coming past. Take care of me, longevity. Half my biology, better believe. Walk in the top, so my and body connected. Better come give us a listen. Better come give us a minute or two. Open the box up, we giving you tools. Giving your engine the fuel that it needs. Breathing into it, it's autoimmune. Make a connection, we're stronger in two. Making us one of a kind of a few. Work on the mind, but show me your moves. If you do what you say, you know what to do. Yeah. Simply walk the talk.